Good morning. Welcome back to the Retirement Report. I'm Hank Parrott, your host. All right, I'm going to kick through some of these slides about internationals and globals and emerging markets. They're a part of a portfolio, but understanding the volatility part there and how it fits with regard to an overall plan is so important. Um, one of the things to understand, for instance, when it comes to portfolio design, and when you're looking at how you, you set up your overall financial plan, think of it this way. One of the things you need to be looking at when it comes to your portfolio is if you're when you're gonna have volatile assets in there, and I mentioned the Russell 2000, small caps tend to be more volatile than large caps. Of course, the S&P 500 itself has an 18, over an 18% standard deviation, so when you're, which is a, a basically a statistical measure of volatility, how much, you know, how much it can go from highs to lows. So when you've gotten in the Russell 2000, has got an even higher standard deviation, and emerging markets and these an even higher standard deviation, a lot of volatility. Portfolio construction can help smooth that out and reduce that volatility, but understanding how that works in your overall financial plan is extremely important. So this is one of those areas where understanding how when you first, if you're within five years of retirement or even 10 years of retirement, or you're already in retirement and maybe you're pulling money from your uh, retirement accounts, or maybe in fact, you're going to, you're coming up against age 70 and a half when you're gonna be, if, even if you didn't need to pull money out, you're gonna be forced to pull money out with regard to required minimum distributions, right? These are all things that you need to take into consideration in your portfolio. So when we do a comprehensive plan, what we're looking at is over the next five years, what are your income needs gonna be from your investments? And that helps us in the construction then of your portfolio, your, your overall investment plan. So we may in fact break up that investment plan to where we have a less volatile portfolio that we're gonna use for income in the short term, then a, a more moderate uh, uh, portfolio for midterm type money, say five to 10 years out, and then if we get into the 10 year plus monies, that's where we can uh, ride out volatility and we can be a little more, uh, uh, let's say aggressive, not, and by aggressive I mean in the amount of stocks that we have in the portfolio, we can withstand a little more volatility to get those higher returns that typically come with that. Now, the other part is we use hedges. Hedges are a way basically where we can use new strategies like I mentioned, some of the uh, the S and P nine and a half percent, right? The Russell two thousand nineteen and a half. Here are a couple of strategies, a couple of indexes that provide us hedging against down markets. All right, one of those being the J P Morgan Mosaic Index. Last year, by the way, ten percent average return, ten point oh seven percent. Now, some of them, such as the uh, Merrill Lynch, has an R P M index. Only it did about a negative one percent, two thirds of a percent last year. So it's important to understand that there are a number of hedging strategies. Not all work as well as others. Another, the Schiller's Barclays Cape Index, and basically what we see uh, with this one is a 9.62 percent return last year. So some of these, the two, for instance, the Mosaic uses asset categories. All right. Again, like we've been talking about, small companies blended with large companies, stocks blended with bonds, this kind of thing. So it uses these asset categories, 15 different asset categories, in fact, in this, uh, but they use a momentum strategy. They're identifying which of those 15 asset categories over the last six months have done the best. And then they look at those, that they narrow that down to nine, and of those nine, they then wait, meaning putting more money in which asset category did the best and working it in, in, in working around the portfolio design, then that becomes the portfolio for say April. Now, what we're doing then is catching this momentum. At the end of April, we look back six months from that period, which ones are doing the best with the least amount of volatility and we create the portfolio for May and then back for May six months and for June. This is done this is called a momentum strategy. And what we've seen in bear markets past is that when the market, the S&P 500 index, say 2000 through 2002, when it was going down at a rate of 10%, then 12%, then 20%, the JP Morgan Mosaic index was actually making money, all right? 6% and then 5% and then 7%. 
So when you've got something that can offset, it works again. That's, remember that word about negative correlation? Even in 08, when the market dropped 37, 38%, the S&P, the mosaic made about 5%. So this is a great one to maybe blend together in your portfolio to help give you some downside protection in a bear market cycle. So this is another tool that can be brought into play. The Schiller Index is another one. Now, the difference with the Schiller and the Mosaic is, remember when we were talking earlier about um, sectors of the economy? So we have asset category. There's that approach. That's Dr. Eugene Fama, who won the Nobel Prize in 2013 for his research in, in equities. Well, a co another winner of the, of the Nobel Prize was Dr. Robert Schiller, and he developed uh, in his uh, equity research, he uses market sectors. So he just slices that market up a little differently. Again, like healthcare, financials, industrials, uh, technology, that type of thing. The Schiller Index, again, is another one that has been a good uh, uh, hedge as far as against market downturns. There's ways that we can squeeze better returns out of that fixed side and yet at the same time reduce the volatility so that during downtimes we're protected as well. All right. Now I'm going to uh, share with you again, we're going to jump in real quick, global stocks and rare underperformance. Again, historically, this is what these numbers are. They're just talking about historic numbers. So if you look at the chart, the blue uh, is showing the S&P 500 index, and that dark gray is showing the uh, Euro-Asia Far East index. So basically, international stocks normally during these different bull market cycles, as you can see back in the early 70s, 74 through 70, uh, through 1980 rather, 82 through 87, it goes all the way to the present, and we see that most of the time, internationals outperform U.S. Two of those periods, from 87 to 2000, and from 3000, or excuse me, 2009 to present, internationals have lagged. And this is one of the concerns. Now, does that mean we're going to see a cycle where internationals come back to the mean, you know, to a higher average, or is it some, does it mean something else? Global growth is stable, though unspectacular. In our next slide. All right, this is one of the things we're seeing also, though, that there are still a lot of problems on the global, uh, in the global area that would give someone concern. All right, I'm concerned. Global growth is broadening. It, even though we're seeing that, uh, only Brazil was still in recession last year. But again, these are, this is adding great volatility, so how you do it is to use it judiciously. Emerging markets are starting to outperform again. So we've got a couple of slides up uh, from that one. Relative performance of the Emerging Markets Index versus All Country World Index. Again, emerging markets are coming off a prolonged period of underperformance. So the next slide will show that. And there you go. You can see in the most recent years to the right how much the emerging markets have underperformed. In fact, a lot of people in, with emerging markets in their portfolios and in our portfolios as well, this is one of the things that's had a little bit of a drag. As you can see, though, from prior periods, too, emerging markets can really drive growth. In fact, if you look at the next side, emerging markets are still outgrowing developed economies. Though they continue to outgrow more mature economies by a healthy margin and are counting for an increasing share of the total world economy. Again, this is adding volatility. Um, let's go ahead and jump up two slides to rates rise again. Rates were up again in the first quarter and the curve flattened as the Federal Reserve uh, tightened monetary policy for the second time in three months. The two-year yield hit its highest level of the cycle. So again, what I'm encouraged mainly when I see this is that we're seeing interest rates being able to, let, allowing the Fed to hopefully nor normalize policy and that the markets aren't swooning as a result of that. That's the real plus. Real returns turn negative is the next one. Rising headline inflation pushed real 10-year yields back into negative territory for the first quarter. Even with long-term inflation expectations still relatively subdued, treasuries do not offer particularly compelling value. In other words, basically, treasuries are still underperforming inflation, negative yield, and we're talking 10-year treasury. We're talking of tying your money up for 10 years. It's a safe play, but it's not one that's going to help you if we're trying to stay ahead of inflation. All right, fixed income returns have remained positive during rate height cycles. This is one of the areas, while negative rate yield, real yields and Fed tightening will, in fact, pressure fixed income returns, they won't eliminate them. Now, this is where we get into understanding high yield. All right, so if we look at the next slide, corporate spreads continue to tighten. 
One of the things that we're seeing here, high yields, and then the next slide is high yields lead the way. Now comes the cautionary tale. We're seeing very large returns on high yield bonds. In 2016, a 17% return, in fact, 6% on corporates, and it goes down through the Barclays uh, Aggregate Bond Index. Now in 2017, year to date, it's the, you know, high yields are up 2.7. Here's the concern there. In fact, if you look at 2015 and 2014, 2014, the high, high corporates were at two and a half and the high, high corporate yields, high, again, high yield bonds, uh, at a negative four and a half percent in 2015. Now, let me share with you, we'll go ahead and get away from the charts for a moment. Let me share with you something here. So I, I went on Morningstar and I picked, I said, let's, let's take a look at the four, you know, four of the top rated uh, high yield bond funds. Okay, now this is one of the things I do. When you come into my office, all right, we're going to get into the first 10 uh, callers to my office, 615-376-5325. Uh, I'm, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm in looking at your portfolio is I'm going to pull Morningstar reports and I'm going to go over these with you. All right, this will be part of that income analysis. So we're taking a break and when we come back, I'm going to show you an example of what one of these looks like or all four of these. These are the top ones, by the way. I look for the best of the high yield bonds. But one of the things when you see high yield, I want to, I'm going to share with you is what does that mean inside of it? Well, let's take a look when we come back, all right? Join me here. We'll be right back on The Retirement Report.